Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's episode. I would like to speak about an interesting idea that actually it's been the idea has been with me for a while. Okay. <laughs> the title of today's episode, tonight's episode, is Conscious Oscillations Between Worlds and Selves. And pretty much I want to share this idea that in, the, uh, in some sense the tension in the moment shifts from being purely a self in the world and a world in the self. Human beings have access to both of these kinds of experiences. You know, there are moments where you will feel your inner world, you're a tiny little thing in a cosmos huge. And there will be times where you will feel the whole cosmos is just existent in your vision. So when man wonders about the importance of experience and existence and how in some sense these patterns are intersecting, I find that in some sense we, uh, how would I say it? It's like throughout the day, there's moments where you're a body that is howling a mind through the projection of a brain. And there are times where you are a mind projecting a body. When, whenever the body becomes inactive, you, you move more as your mind. When in some sense, um, you can say the body becomes incredibly active. The mind is unnecessary because the objective, the, the receiver of the sensory perception is busy. I have always been fascinated how in many moments of my life where I've been doing something, my attention has been elsewhere. I could have been in that moment cleaning something, you know, uh, cleaning the dishes and while I was cleaning the dishes I was thinking of in some sense uh, tomorrow where I would be at a certain time and it's kind of strange because objectively we're in one room but it seems that subjectively there's more the mind is not just in a material reality you know, there is this saying that they say some people cannot um, dream of a face they've never seen. Well, I, I feel that's not true, but on some level it's very hard to prove that it's not true because there is a sort of some subconscious reception of the mind. That means everything since your childhood, your, your intelligence has been recording, however, it has not been activating. So what does that mean? That means when I, in certain moments of my life where I've kind of dived within, I can say, uh, in some sense I've become a pure mind in the moment, I can say that the access to the content of the mind shifts in accordance to the type of self. The type of self you are uh, will dictate how you receive the world. You know, I, I found it fascinating. Carl Jung has this quote where he says, um, before I say Carl Jung's quote, guys, pretty much the idea here is I'm saying that the conscious, the, the attention as a moment of being shifts. It shifts between the experience of the self and it shifts between the experience of the world. And believe it or not, before I have this kind of, you can say, I mean, for me, it's a theory, but I'll share it to the world as a hypothesis that in some sense, the child's mind actually is being the world at first. That child was not uh, adopted individual consciousness yet, has not consciously uh, become a part of the linguistic simulation. In some sense, the mind's attempt of the newborn child is to be its space. The mind is a uh, vision. Now, is the whole moment's vision. Now, so it's kind of like in an objective realm, uh, an objective self appears. Now, this objective self, again, so check this out, guys. Here's the perfect relationship before I get to the Carl Jung quote. <laughs> so in some sense, unconscious 
um, objective world, just first was the world, let's say, uh, the objective world, then came a conscious objective self. Or let me say it like this. First, there was an unconscious world. Then there came an unconscious self, a moving body that had no idea what it was. Then there came a conscious world. And then there came from that conscious world, a conscious self. What does that mean? That means your mind, before you identify with anything, is actually identifying with the whole moment. We cherry-pick through language and speech our individual stories. So, let's say Carl Jung somehow, his voice found, us, found our ear as if he was in the room. And he said... Unless you make the unconscious conscious, it will, dict it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So I want to point out that the mind actually is oscillating between conscious realities and unconscious realities. Unconscious realities have, have more subjective significance. Uh, conscious realities have more objective significance. That means, uh, you know, it's like uh, it's kind of evidence for me to knock on this laptop uh, as a suggestion of its actually existing as an object. You know, but when I look at this object, I do understand that my body has an objective relationship with matter. You know, it's as if if I identify as matter, of course, I'm a material being. But if I see that the matter is being observed by a sort of spherically endless moment, then the game changes, guys. So when I say conscious oscillations between worlds and selves, it's as if there is a dimension where the intelligence of the being is just purely being the world. It's static. It's like a picture. It's like from pictures the movies arise, you know? Many people have this vision that the mind, I guess mechanism, I mean, I tend to see it as a biological program. That means whether man can figure out how the program was written or not, well, there's a program. It's like there's the, you can say the seasons are a program. The way the planet uh, orbits around the sun, you can say it's a program. Anything that pretty much has a sort of repetition in it, will eventually be seen to have laws. That means imagine the gravity of our planet changed with our weather. You know, in winters there was kind of like less gravity. You know, imagine in summers there was like... Probably it's not good to have more gravity in the summer. <laughs> but what I'm saying is the mind can work with various laws and eventually as the attention replicates something. So what does that mean? That means this computer in front of me, it's in one dimension, it's in one objective uh, dimension of existence. But the, if I in my mind visualize another computer, the same computer right beside this computer hovering in the air, now that second computer I can change. I can instantly change because I consider that it had a subjective cause, you know, even though the effect, there was an extraction of an objective effect. That means like we speak in order to move matter, you know, we're kind of like Jedi's, you know, it's like we've seen this in various forms of medium where it's like, think of it this way, the Jedi would raise his hand and suddenly the object would levitate and come to his hand. Okay, now the human being uses words. He's like, can you please pass me the salt? And just these sounds traveling across the room are enough of another subjective design for another human receiver to take in the language and then suddenly help the world occur. So I realized that when you really make life a personal journey, like seriously, when you make life a personal journey, it becomes... Um, you find out the secrets of the self, but the secrets of the world will not occur until the pieces 
uh, 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 it's a collective effort. Literally, um, think of it this way. This is what Mr. Within is saying. Imagine you sit down in a moment and you notice that there can be a state of mind. I mean, this was the whole point of enlightenment and nirvana and moksha and samadhi. In some sense, the ultimate state. So many human beings were like, all right, there's a state of mind I can experience that's going to be beyond my, what I've seen before, right? What I'm trying to say is that language is an invisible mover once received by another intelligent being. It can move them. And what it is, is I wondered for a long time what anger was. I had heard many things about anger. I had heard in some sense... That Buddha had spoke about anger as if it was burning coal. That it burnt the hand of the person who got angry, but it also burnt the person the burning coal was thrown at. We have this Tibetan Buddhist um, sage by the name of Sogyal Rinpoche, I believe. And what he says is that unless you conquer anger, all your, en your enemies will be inexhaustible. Just take that in, guys. What does that mean? Unless you find a state of mind where the resistance to the existent is no longer there, then there comes freedom. You see, it's the resistance. It's the suffering of life that makes people... Or makes people want to escape it. And if they can't objectively escape it, they try to subjectively escape it. And sometimes it's easier to look at something else rather than look at something that doesn't work and try to fix it. Life is a story that we pick up, make our own, and then, like a cocoon, metamorphosize out of. I am telling you, dear listeners, we are living in language just like we're living in our houses. Just like we're living in our cities, we're living in certain rules of how reality can be defined. And so if the species does not develop a new relationship with language, it has refused to develop a new relationship with the mind. And now in 2000, we're in 2020 now. In 2020, it's, I, I, I had this sort of vision that more than ever in history, the philosophical mind is required. The philosophical mind is the patience to see the other side. That is it. That means if there was a treasure box and in some sense there was a philosopher there, there was a, let's say, a scientific person there, uh, uh, a religious person there, and a spiritual person. Four type of people are in front of this treasure box. We see the religious person says only God can open this treasure box. We see the scientific person says, uh, we don't know there's even treasure until we open the treasure box. And because the treasure box can't be opened, there's no saying that there is, it's going to be opened by God. You know? And we have 
the spiritual person suddenly being like, all right, the treasure box is here and now, you know, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> this, this is like, you know, the, like Eckhart Tolle to the power of Eckhart Tolle, you know. <laughs> and then we have the philosopher. And the philosopher is a strange, it's a very strange archetype in the sense that it cares for how far the language can go to reveal. Eventually, regardless of all these types of people that are in front of the treasure box, eventually someone comes out of nowhere and opens the treasure box and everybody sees what's inside, what they see their own truth. And eventually, you know, the person says that it has in some sense By the way, guys, uh, as I say the talk, just, just so people know, as I say the talk, the chat section is open. So midway through the talk, as, as I'm explaining certain things, if there's any comments or anybody wants me to um, emphasize something or share something, uh, definitely feel free to um, use the chat section. But I'm going to, you know, honor the direction of the talk. Um, <clears throat> so conscious oscillations between worlds and selves and the realization of the presence of the attention and the recognition that regardless of what classification, what profession, what mask one wears, when they take off the mask, the human value of existing is equal. That means no person can go to another person and be like, yo, I exist more than you. <laughs> like they can't, you can't, you, existential value, everything's equal. But now how this existence has appeared due to certain positions, simply we got to realize the hierarchy, you can't blame it on a patriarchy or a matriarchy. Do you know? You cannot blame any of it. It's nature. Let me tell you what that means. That means when you go look at nature, the, the food chain that we manage as a species to step out of the forest and kind of build a more civilized world to live in so our minds could breathe, you know? I'm just saying that nature has a sort of hierarchy. And the resolution to nature, this was the ultimate conclusion. Whether it was somebody saying like, oh, it's the divine will, it's destiny, it's written in the stars, it's the will of my ancestors, you know, uh, it's the spirit of nature. What, whatever you call it or you can, it, for all, what it is, is landscape, landscape observed, evocation of subjective landscape. Subjective landscape absorbed, evocation, uh, uh, evocation of, in some sense, the profound witness. Whenever you feel something profound in your life is because you're getting to the edge of the unknown of that reality. So you see, it's, it's kind of interesting that people, you see a lot, especially in sports, where the athlete, like those motorcycle kind of like riders, you see them, I, I forget the name, what is it, DMX, DMX or something, like those... Um, the guy goes and does like three backflips from one side of a hill and lands on the other side of the hill and the audience is like, whoa, this human being just defied what our beliefs on the sport, you know? It's that we the, the ego likes to get close to the unknown, but it doesn't like to, in some sense, not exist. I tell people, a lot of people, because guys, I'm telling you, I have walked in communities where people have believed in gods. I have walked in communities where people have not believed in gods. I have walked in communities where people have believed everything in between. <laughs> and I am telling you that um, emotional freedom truly arises from a freedom where you kind of can observe your thoughts like objects in the room. Right now you are observing my voice, you know. Right now, the whole moment of your being has content in it where you can observe. And eventually you can see, you can zoom in and out. Something I do that I find um, 
kind of maybe evident in these talks that I, I, I think, I don't know how, I think it's just will, uh, um, a sort of uh, wonder, honest wonder. Nothing is better than that. Nothing can teach a person better because at some point every human being is going to realize nobody has your eyes. Just take that in. Nobody on this planet has your eyes. So if you as a human being are suffering, nobody can see that suffering first un until you communicate it. Okay, so um, guys, I'm going to engage the chat section. Um, Sunray V. Will over love, care, emotions, waver though, one must think to feel. Listen, before you had to do anything in this life, before you had to even think, there must have been something there to think. Now, I find that we have to free ourselves from how language is encapsulating the limits of the world. So what I mean by that is you got to realize you can have an approach to the moment where it's all one moment. Everything that has ever happened has been one moment. As if this candle, even when you sleep, it doesn't go off. This candle has been lit. Okay, so in a very singular dimension, we don't need categories. So you can say that whether it's an emotion or a thought or whatever, it's a moment of experience. But now if we want to take it to a more multidimensional context where we're kind of separating the emotion, separating the thought and kind of giving a unique design to our subjective realm. Well, that's that becomes interesting because I've kind of thought about this. For example, the Buddhist approach is they say when you pay attention to one thought too long, um, it leads to a sort of emotion. And I think the same, the reason is, is for example, you look at an object, any object, and if you keep looking at it, you're going to get thoughts. Like right now, there's a glass of water. I'm looking at a glass of water, right? Now, first view, glass of water. Second view, wait a minute, what if a plant, what if the roots of a plant were in that glass of water? Do you know? And then the next thought is, what if that glass of water was the size of a skyscraper? What if this glass of water was in some sense, the glass was invisible, but the water was in, still in the shape? So you see the mind as it looks at something, it just da, 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 da. Like it's, it's like a rhythm, the attention, anything that becomes important for you in this life, suddenly you get a rhythm. It's like the doors of karma automatically important, uh, automatically open. So... What I'm saying is that similarly to how I saw that glass of water and thoughts arose, you can also look at subjectivity and have thoughts ar arise. And when a human being, when a human being understands the freedom of how there is an empty page, the mind is like an empty page where every day it's like a new sentence is written. And that new sentence defines everything that was, it's the continuation of yesterday. So what I mean by that is that <sighs> your own discretion is required any time you want to perceive multidimensionally your own intelligence. The whole point of life is like an individual being can move. And what is actually moving the individual being is a, a, a sort of attention. But the roots of this attention are in the unknown. Similar to the, a tree where the roots are in the soil, you can't see the roots. Similarly, it's like I find the attention in the moment, this mystery of consciousness that is fascinating us all into a paradox is like,
simply guys to kind of clear up the picture I'm painting when there is freedom of will that freedom of will can redictate value when you realize in your subjective realms you can redictate value what does that mean that means any design put in front of you can move in another way behind your eyes so what you see in front of your eyes can move differently behind your eyes you know we have to and real, it's like we're in two dimensions at the same time, and any time we choose one side of the spectrum, we get confused. Something, guys, um, I, I, I should probably find a way to kind of... Here, I'll say it like this. <clears throat> Pretty much every human being has their own relationship with their subjective realm. Their subjective realm can, over time, as they get exposed to various... Uh, streams of data it can get polished and changed and pretty much the story you tell yourself about what life is is not just changing in accordance to your body's energy levels it's not just changing in accordance to what kind of ecosystem environment you're living in you know There's a strange freedom behind the eyes of the human being that only because it realizes it's mortal, it can become responsible of the conscious moment. Sometimes I've sat down and it's been like a sunny day, you know, like after lunch, you know, when a person sits down in a park or somewhere, you know, like <laughs> it's like that kind of like in the sun kind of mellow vibe. I have wondered in those in those moments, like if hum, if the consciousness was eternal, you know, as Aristotle says, it's the sign of an educated mind to entertain an idea without accepting it. So let's just entertain the idea of how the personality would be if people were eternal beings instead of temporary objective beings. You know what I realized, guys? It would be utter boredom. There would be nothing to live for. I realize it's like um, the reason that the infinite is the edge of man's mind because beyond the infinite, there is no, there is no, there is nothing new. I consider that a subjective evolution took place exactly the moment the objective creature could see itself could observe itself could realize that it is here the moment the mind was awake enough to be that's when all the doership came do you know I remember in one of my talks, I think it's called The Orphans of Existence. Like it was a heavy talk. I gave it uh, in 2015, I think, 14, 15. But anyways, The Orphans of Existence was this idea that for, I mean, in kind of being raised in Iran as a young kid, I would go, we would go by the streets and people were different classes of people. I mean, in every streets of the world, you know, busy streets of the downtown areas of the world, the successful and the defeated walk in the same streets. So in some sense, I remember being in Iran and uh, I was young. I was eight, seven. No, I wasn't eight. I was seven. 
And I remember I'm walking past the store, me, my brother, and my mother. And uh, we're both holding my mother's hands. And in that moment, we see, I, I'll never forget it. There was a skinny kind of beggar kid who was selling on, on a piece of paper fortunes. Like fortune, imagine like what you see in a fortune cookie, but like put in a letter. And the kid was selling that and also was selling a pack of gum, right? And the kid was just sitting there quietly as if defeated, as if I, in my, like I didn't understand it. There's, there's so many things in my life that when I was younger, I didn't comprehend. Only years later when the experience was uh, relit, was I started actually truly crying for what had happened, you know? It's, um, it's the same thing. Um, <laughs> um, as language, but I'll get, get to that. Pretty much what I'm saying is I, I remember seeing uh, failure, you know? You can't really control nature as an individual part of it, but you can control how you see what nature is doing. All of knowledge has to do with a linguistic self. That linguistic self is also in a linguistic world. And that linguistic world is endlessly, by the efforts of humanity, trying to be... Con it's like we're trying to make the subjective realm 100% be like the objective realm, you know? The issue is um, the new cannot be avoided by any civilization. You know, there are poems, many poems around the world that in some sense, it's like the person feels guilty about what they're doing on, on the planet or what's occurring on the planet. But there's very few poems, very few, on how the world feels guilty. Like, look at this picture I've chosen. I don't know who the artist is. If anybody knows, please give a shout out. But um, in some sense, the world is aware of that girl who's there. Do you see? It's as if it's a, it's a fractal representation of how, just like how the child could make the teddy bear alive, it could make the world alive. Um, dear Sunray V, I'll tell you this, um, don't seek an instruction booklet because there is no, it, objectively there's rules and sci there's not only scientific rules, but you know, social and c the cultural program and the many rules that must be acknowledged. Uh, at least the person needs to be aware of them. Uh, and then it's yeah, what I'm, I don't know how to say it, but I'm saying it's like, um, there is a naturalness and a more simpler way the human being can function rather than complex ideological searching. There was a time in my life where, yeah, I was looking for, um, some sort of truth behind a whale. But that moment ended as quickly as I realized how the, the, just the tiniest percentage of dishonesty can shift your experience of your subjective realm. Literally, it can arise a storm. So really, the unknown is uh, kind of as mysterious as fire, something not to play with. But I realized that in our civilization, there's been a restriction. So think of it this way, guys. This is why I started to kind of uh, try to see if humanity would shine a spotlight one more time on how the word soul is not a story, but in some sense, it's that X factor unknown variable like in a mathematical equ equation. 
really life is it starts in two ways imagine it's like one tree and then this tree branches out into two ways okay two branches one branch is the known one branch is the unknown what does that mean that means you as a human being in your moment there's known factors known phenomena and there's unknown phenomena right so the known and the unknown and when you realize every branch of knowledge is limited to this dualistic framework of what is observable and what isn't, the this, this student should evolve into an explorer of the subtler, uh, one subtler planes, one subjective realm. That means children are, in some sense, you know, children are being thrown into a system where they feel their choice is not there. I really, somebody once said, anybody who does a job they don't love, they, they shouldn't get paid. And I thought about that. I thought about that and I'm like, what if that law was there and every institution that was being run was done by a sort of inspiration and not just monetary we have reduced the world to um, uh, paper in our pockets the world is way more mysterious than numbers on a digital screen a new effort it's the calling I, I talk about it it's like when the human being finds the love of the species You know, there was a um, very cool guy, the Zen master, <laughs> by the name of Chuang Tzu. And Chuang Tzu, I'm going to tell you two, two uh, stories about him. One, that Chuang Tzu, is, I don't remember the exact quote, but he was saying something so profound that he's like, thoughts are like leaves on a tree. They change uh, by the season. And I thought, oh my God, it's like, it's so true that I've had a thought on myself. Like right now I have a thought on myself and tomorrow I'm going to wake up and the leaves are going to be different in texture. You see, there's, think of it this way. Right now on this planet, there's 8 billion people, whether they are, um, um, whether they are, their attitudes are open or closed to the world. There's 8 billion people doing 8 billion unique activities in every moment, fathoming 8 billion unique ideas. And I was like, whoa. There is 8 billion creatures on a pebble in a light beam. We're on a rock in the middle of nowhere, guys. And people, regardless of our civility, there will always be a freak out factor to the existential condition. So really what it is, is 8 billion creatures of the same species in a rock. I mean, nature is giving us clues, guys. You see, you see um, birds, they synchronistically fly together. You see fish, a school of fish swim together, you know, whether the wolf pack is running in Vegas or, <laughs> or in some sense in the forest, the wolves run together. Do you see lions uh, stay in their pride? So, so what it is, <clears throat> is that on some level, you are a natural part of this world. So you have to have the ability, your free will has to have the ability to let nature, to trust nature enough for it to happen. So what does that mean? That means just pretty much in an instant, trust your objective reality, 
trust uh, all, uh, trust your body. That's what I'm saying. Trust the vehicle of your attention. What I'm saying is man's relationship, because there is the unknown, can be limitless as much as it can be limited. Every moment in your life, your mind has fathomed a version of you. If any time your mind has even seen an inefficient self, from the beginning of your birth, I'm talking, Mr. Within is saying, from the beginning you were born, where, from where your conscious memory of an individual began, till now. Any moment, in every moment where you, the person has had an inefficient or inferior or a suffering thought, a thought where the suffering is kind of like, um, it starts low. So what I'm saying is, it's as if in every moment of suffering, I realized the mind also had an ability to consider the joy. You know, there's, um, um, I said I, I'm going to say two stories about Chang Tzu. This, this episode might be filled with stories, guys. You know, there are. <laughs> Chang Tzu suddenly is found by his disciples one morning sitting in a meditative pose but his face is frustrated and he's as if his students are like oh my god what happened they see a sort of chaos in the eyes of chang Tzu, and his disciples go up to him it's like yo bro <laughs> they're like chang Tzu, what happened man if you're if you're this in in such an inner chaos then we're all doomed as your disciples you know they're trying to cheer him up or whatever. And so Chang Su tells these guys, tells, tells, his, um, tells his disciples back in the day. I got to respect the story. Um, he tells them, guys, last night I had a dream. I was a butterfly. And people are like, so what? <laughs> He's like, last night I had a dream. I was a butterfly. And I really was a butterfly in my dream. But then I woke up and then I realized I don't know whether I am a man dreaming I'm a butterfly or I'm a butterfly dreaming I'm a Zen master. I don't know if I'm a Zen master dreaming I'm a butterfly or a Zen, you know. So it was a, it was a sort of, that was a gift. That was a gift to Chang Su's conscious mind. Sometimes when paradoxes enter your reality, that's kind of like doors opening. You know, karmic doors opening, where the mind has had enough balance, or as Moriyo Shiva would say, witnessing the soul of heaven and earth. Forget about hell, it's just earth and heaven. There's the objective realm and the, uh, the subjective realm. In some sense, there is matter, and then there is the other. <clears throat> and so Chang Su was wise. Because he realized just like how the leaves on the tree change, so does the content of the mind. So how much control do you have over thoughts? They come and go. Some thoughts, like uh, for me, that's why I'm saying, like when I give these talks, it's like there's a river of thoughts moving me. There's a, there's a sort of film happening. There was a time where my thinking would be language first, then image. But any person who goes that route, it's like the long way. Do you know? So you won't feel really creative. What it is, is you got to start from freedom or the alt, find the, uh, by your starting point should be an ultimate freedom where from the ultimate freedom discipline happens. That means instead of people thinking of going to heaven, assume you were in heaven right now, how would you behave? The seeds of a better world, uh, you know, are planted in the minds of the living beings. Life is filled with design. 
pretty much every human being is swimming in design both behind their eyes and in front of their eyes in front of their eyes the designs are known as reality behind your eyes we consider it unknown so some people use the word imagination um, for younger audiences think of imagination as your own nation of images you know all the content that your mind has received from the living world and <clears throat> Think of it this way, if, if you cannot realize that if you were to find any sort of peace or state of mind, it would still be an experience of now. Like think about it this way, that in every moment of your life that you have traveled, you have gone everywhere, the experience of awareness to existence has been unchanging. So this is the kind of playful thing. It's, it's like it's very strange because the mystical, the supreme mystical insight is that the ultimate state can only be received by being that is that state. So what does that mean? That means <clears throat> Okay, just a second guys. So, um, all right. Okay, let's see. So, uh, guys, my attention is coming on the chat section to the chat section. Um, um, the chalice and seed. Yeah, that's uh, Buddhist images. Like, I haven't studied it as much as I should, but I, some of it I, ha I feel I innately know its meaning. So Nevidel Universe, welcome to the talk, man. What, what, uh, what about the desire of, hu of the humankind to dominate his world? What about the desire of the humankind to dominate his world? Well, any sort of action is a response to something seen in the world. To dominate his world, I think another way of saying that perhaps, Nebidal universe, is why is there continuity? Because whether it's domination, whether it's liberation, whether whatever it is, something is continuity, continuing. So you see, I feel a creature will act intensely if its world is occurring intensely for it. The desire of humankind to dominate his world, do you know what it is? It's a desire for one moment of bliss. I think that human nature, of course, has to prove itself. You know, why is it that the lion doesn't just, like the hyena, eat a corpse? It has to kill the prey itself and then eat it. The lion trusts its own experience. Now, here's the thing, uh, Nevidel uh, Universe, I'll tell you this, man. Here's the thing, the idea of the human, I personally divided into an objective relationship and a subjective relationship and the domination occurs through not just, it could just be the chemistry, they could even just make a kind of, put something in the water that makes every person want to kind of like uh, devour their world, you know what I mean? But the thing is,
I think it's fear of non-existence. That's the, I, that's the, if this was a, who wants to be a millionaire show, that would be my final answer. Never do. <laughs> Universe, you know, that the desire to dominate is only there when there's weakness. I mean, think about your mind. If you never had anything violent happen to you, Imagine in the future generations, we reach some utopic state as a civilization. Children are raised in a world where the only violence is in virtual reality. There's no violence allowed. Do you know? Then they would not even have the idea to dominate. And it's sometimes it's very, very interesting because world domination is sometimes when a, it's as if so, you are holding a picture in front of your face and you're running after the picture. So it's, there's a blindness to the domination of the world because it's your world. So it's like it's the same thing as an angry man. An angry person is not really in the room. They're in the room of their past where they couldn't react and now they're reacting. Do you know what that means? That means the guy back in the day, like somebody pushed him, he couldn't push the person back. Then there comes a moment, you know, where... But it, like, you know, years later where somebody just taps him on the shoulder and the guy just like as if he's getting ready to push someone back suddenly. It's as if there's many moments in life where the mind attempts uh, a design of an archetype and that archetype doesn't fulfill its purpose. And if it doesn't fulfill its person, purpose and the attention doesn't finish what it has to do with the idea, it will try to live in the idea like a shell, like, the, like a snail in a shell. Do you know what I mean? So, so for me, my relationship is that I, I'm telling people before we get into any metaphysics, because we got to study language, because the issue is even if there is something in the unknown, people uh, can own language. Uh, they can, in some sense, hide it through language. So let me tell you this Zen story. It's totally relevant. Uh, <laughs> there's this guy. He finds himself in this incredible grassland. He suddenly sits there. He's alone in a meditative pose as is traditional and as he's been kind of exposed to. And so as he's there sitting, he suddenly gets this next level realization. Literally, it's like he doesn't do anything. There's no training. He's just paying attention to the world in a way where he sees something more out of it, right? And he gets this sort of kind of uh, realization. Now, in the Zen story, this is Zen story I read online, guys. It, it's, in this Zen story, there's a minion, dark minion in another dimension. And this dark minion in another dimension uh, suddenly sees this guy getting more enlightened and realizing more about the truth. And this dark minion is like, holy shit, I'm going to go say this to the dark lord. The dark, dark minion runs to the dark lord, and here's the moral of the story, guys. The dark minion runs to the dark lord and says, dark lord, this guy's realizing more about the truth of the world. What do we do? The Dark Lord says, don't worry about it, because whatever truth that man experiences, it's in human nature to make a belief out of it. That means I realize unless the species graduates beyond the technology of language, everything will be subjective till the end of time. So, so, so there's, there's, there's something there, guys, that man is also an animal. We're not perfectly, we're, it's like, we're not pure mind and we're not pure animal. Do you know? We're something in between. I see, I see it as an intersection. Imagine like a Cartesian plane. In one dimension, it's like a totally endless subjective landscape. That means I can imagine an object floating in the air and I'm like, wait a minute, how come the laws of gravity are not occurring in my imagination? Do you know? So my imagination can even imagine gravity. So eventually you kind of, it's like, it, it's hilarious, guys. It's like, it's like this. Imagine a writer writes this book uh, and he gets close to the ending. And then suddenly he takes the, lifts the pen a cent, couple centimeters above and for a second forgets what he wrote and begins to read backwards, reverse engineer backwards okay, to come to some conclusion of how the story was built, how reality emerged as a conscious form with definable boundaries and intelligent factors. 
language behind our eyes is actually, I, this is a strange word to say, but it, it's like subjective shape-shifting. But the shape shifts in accordance to where the attention goes. And shape-shifting, the idea has been given a bad rap, but it's pretty much like you can say ice shape-shifts into, like, water. <laughs> you know, into liquid form, you know, that liquid form shape shifts, you know, <laughs> into gas. I say it's a, a nevital universe. I say it's a hybrid between an objective realm and a subjective realm. The subjective realm is strangely self-authored. It's self-originated. That means it's like a hockey ring where you can throw the puck whatever direction. Hit the puck whatever direction. So what I'm saying is there is um, there is a freedom behind our eyes that has nothing to do with the human idea and has nothing to do with any idea. It's such a direct experience that if somebody talks about it, you know, uh, there may be a, perhaps there may be many people, you know, many people uh, right perhaps in the future who will hear my talks. Many like let's say you can say yogic minded people and they may scold me they may be like why is this guy talking and i'll tell you because civilization has reached that point you know it's like uh it's like the person they ask them hey man do you know um what's going on and the person is like okay let me just ask the spirit of the planet <laughs> you see they don't, they don't teach this. We don't know how to value our minds, so we ignore it. It's a tragedy. You know, I, I found out something, that if you only work hard, you, you're going to want machine legs soon. So the mentality of just working hard is, is not enough. I think what it is, is literally I got to treat civilization like a garden. And in this garden, there's various plants growing. Now the human beings that are alive in, in their era, you know, in their, in their uh, generation, they have to look at the world, attend to it, to show something that did not exist before. I, I realize the whole film industry is obsessed about what people want to watch. And then I was like, what do people want to watch? And I remember uh, hearing this sentence that was, um, I don't know who said it, but somebody wrote like, the best book to read is the one you're going to write. And I realized the greatest joy is a freedom to experience one's evolutionary ability. That means really the purpose of life is you're being it, so you're kind of doing it already. But the, per the, the point is that man has a mind. Now this mind gives him access to a very sophisticated use of language to um, re-sculpt the world. So what it is, is when I say these words, the physical world is not changing. It is the subjective realms that are in some sense shifting. Okay, so um, respectfully, Nevidal Universe guys, I'm, I'm responding to something in the chat. Um, you say I have a strange sensation. Uh, uh, respectfully, I'm going to share it. I feel it can be very useful. I have a strange sensation sometimes. Nevidal Universe says I have a strange sensation sometimes since I had few years ago a sort of illumination that I am trapped in, uh, into a virtual game and my conscience was 
uh, separated between two worlds, but the material world wins. Okay. I'm just going to approach this idea from how I've been introduced to it, from my universe, uh, Nevada. And the way it was that the first, the concept came to me in different ways, but the first time it came was when somebody told me when I heard the word prison planet. When I heard the word prison planet, I felt exactly the, sim the every feeling any person gets when they feel for a second life is a simulation, you know? So, no problem, man. But I'm just going to finish responding to what you're saying. <laughs> Uh, yes, life can be a simulation. Re in modern times, Elon Musk says there's one billionth of a chance that we're living inside a kind of a, an advanced video game in, in, indistinguishable from reality. And the ancient yogis pretty much, they all wanted to escape the karmic material universe where desires kept you an animal endlessly. So, so, so like, do you see what I mean? Like this idea of a simulation was there. The interesting thing is that we can't really be purely materialists because we need at least the other side. This is why I'm saying the mind and language functions dualistically. So any person who just claims to one side will suddenly suffer. They have to confront the other. The moment you think you're a good person all the time, anything you do that, that you feel is not good, suddenly it's like your attention goes on the back. Do you see? Because it's referential, because reality is, it's not just the planet that has an axis, every person's mind has an axis. A certain way the world was uh, embraced by you, welcomed by you to have meaning. So this idea, let me tell you, I even had a dream, guys, where I saw... This was in 2013. It was the most one of the, like it's in it's it's the top of the list of the most one of the most unique experiences that's ever happened to me on this planet. And um, I pretty much had a dream, and in the dream, I'm in this kind of sleep paralysis, mind awake sooner than the body kind of situation. In my like, I'm just my attention is there, but my body is asleep, and my breathing is like I can feel my breathing. It's like sleep breathing, you know. So my it's like my mind had my attention had awoke. The mind's eyes had opened sooner than the body's eyes. So in that moment, what happens is I hear a word, a very profound word, which I instantly knew the meaning of. Now, I speak about this word in, in many of my other talks called any talk that has pilot of consciousness in it. You'll, you'll hear me talk about this. So, so, so anyways, um, I had this experience and in the experience, I say this word, I just instantly know the spelling and the word and I say the word, and there is an instant lift off. And in that instant liftoff, I, I find myself in a sort of vision. This is a dream state, imagine. In, my, in, in that dream, I just see literally space. Imagine like outer space, how you would see it in movies. And a giant stone wall with an inverted triangle that was like this cave, this giant inverted tri triangular cave on this wall in the middle of space, you know, and th it, that cave went so inside, like it, it went so in that I could not even see. It was like just, you could see the darkness of the cave. And in the dream, I just instantly knew there was a restriction of access. I wasn't afraid, but I knew there was a restriction. It was as if, imagine like a person going beside, you know, um, you know, smoking in an area they shouldn't, for example. You know, it's a restrict, restricted area. Do you know? <sighs> Anyways, in that dream, there's also something else that I see that appears to me as some sort of... The theme, I would say, would be some sort of extraterrestrial imprisonment. There was that kind of imagery at the time. And what happens is I wake up 
And I had this for, it was like a week, for one week, <laughs> for one week, I was literally living with this idea that I felt I was this other being in some sort of galactic prison and this life was a simulation from that galactic prison of what I was, you know? And I had this sort of, oh my God, prison planet mentality until I came to this realization that if the complex problem can exist, so can the simple solution. And so language moves in many ways. Scientists, to me, are champions of the mind in concentration. Yet, they do not realize that whatever experimental finding of an objective measure of the world they find, they are bringing it in a civilization that because it has emotions, the dimension of emotions is present, civilization is not just functioning with rational and irrational ideas. So you will be searching life until you realize that the greatest thing that life can be is a mirror. That means, think about you, Albert Einstein. Suddenly imagine you're in Albert Einstein's classroom and you're on the front desk of the classroom, you know, and Albert Einstein is teaching and Albert Einstein just comes up to you and says you, suddenly points to you and says you, are the next Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein is telling you you're the next Albert Einstein. In that moment, when Albert Einstein is telling you you are the next Albert Einstein, it's like the, sub, the archetype literally can, through belief shifts, through just realization of a possibility shift, so I'm kind of noticing that we have to, as human beings, learn to handle reality in uh, three things. Three dimensions need to be confronted and pretty much life can be maintained better. You know, efficient vision uh, arises this way. One is acknowledge uh, the void. First thing you do is acknowledge the void. You saw in the movie Gladiator, that dude, before he went into a fight, he got the dirt and he put it on his hand in a sense of honoring the earth around him, realizing it was like, this is nature, for example, you know? <clears throat> and he would also do it so he could hold the sword better. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's like he confronted the void. Once you accept the void, then you realize what else is left to experience your will. The fear of emptiness can make a person... Uh, full of <sighs> thoughts can be savage, guys. They can be savage. I've seen it in third world countries, or I should say in developing countries, and in countries that are not developed. Sorry, in countries that are developed. And what it is, is that language is being believed more savagely in non-educated parts of the world. But in the non-educated parts of the world, their relationship with the nature and the simplicity of their lives is harmony enough. You got to think of it this way. I remember talking to a friend of mine and uh, he was upset about something he had done years ago that not, not like a year ago where he felt he shouldn't have done it. And I told him, you know, and he's like, he felt he had kind of made others upset, Do you know? And then I told him, hey man, if you can't forgive yourself, how do you expect others to forgive you? If you cannot 
access your own direct experience, how can you expect others to? So really what it is, is this, this kind of oscillation between self and world is a shift of the attention as object and subject of experience and then experiencer. Object and subject of experience, then experiencer. Yeah, and the second thing is the singular dimension and the third, which is inevitably from the dualistic, think of it this way. Acknowledge these dimensions and the pilot navigates swiftly in reality, in this plane of existence. The, the void dimension, which I spoke about, the singular dimension, how emptiness and something have a relationship with one another. That means after you're content with the emptiness, that means the, art, the author, as the writer, has finally found comfort to trust the empty page to write on it. Now there's emptiness. The second thing is the singular dimension. Human intelligence has free will. We cannot avoid this. It's an evolutionary opportunity. On some level, yes, desires can blind us. But on another level, without desire, we would not explore. So it's like the word desire has to go away and we have to find new ways of explaining these ideas. After you have found, your mind has found a contentment with the void, with the zero dimension, has found contentment with, from the zero to the singular and from the singular to the zero, has found contentment with both of these, then the mind would move from the singular into the relationship of the dualistic and the singular. So your you are your contentment with any singular phenomena, then you're also content with any dualistic phenomena. And then it comes from a state where you experience yourself as a mind projecting a body, where that's where you you have contentment with from any dualistic dimension, anything going to singular and eventually going to zero. So you're ultimately becoming contentment content with these in a way where as if your subconscious has become your ally. After the singular and the dualistic, then comes something unique, where from the dualistic, there is, there's, I, instead of me telling you the third or whatever, I'm going to say infinity. After duality, there comes infinity. Duality is the father of infinity. The relationship to be able to be a human being that has contentment with the dualistic dimension, with how things are in polar opposites, night and day, good and bad, uh, visible, invisible, known, unknown, you find comfort with this. This is pretty much you finding comfort with your subjective realm. And then when it comes to the infinite, then it goes to a state of mind where our current language technology can't do anything about it, but the direct experiencer can perceive beyond it. So it's as if you see something before you can even articulate it, but because you've seen something, there's a value there, it just needs to be expressed. So what I'm saying is, is, is pretty much what I did there, guys, was it's, I have this theory, I, I thought of what's the simplest way and to kind of keep the mathematical language alive. We have to, um, zero, the zero dimension, the one dimension, the second dimension, the void is the, these are metaphors, guys. Think of this as kind of my playful mythology in the moment that I evoked. So simplicity, the ultimate is simplicity. If life is complex for you, you got to ask yourself, all right, what would be the opposite of this universe? And you'd see it would be the simple. So you have access to the simple. So Mr. Within it, like what I'm telling you guys right now, now as a species, after we realize we have access to the complex, we have access to the simple. Now there's a civilization in front of us. What do we do about it? 
now this is where I, 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 I the, my, my effort is no longer, I'm, I realize we're not, the species is not at a point to be able to find solutions to its problems. Its problems are bigger. That means the holes in the boat are bigger than we can solve. So it's kind of like before this giant ship sinks, we have to create another boat or we have to realign the boat, you know? So, so what I mean by that is that the, it's the, and in, what I'm saying is now, in, uh, how can I tell you? We have to find the ultimate questions. The question is more important than the answer now. Because the question will evoke an experiential search, self-inquiry. To be honest, we are voices in the void. We are candles lit for some time. We tend to think life is about self, so the human being becomes self-obsessed. As it becomes self-obsessed, it clothes the self with various terms, definitions, ideologies. It begins uh, connecting ideology to itself, just like in the, in the future you were trying to connect technology to the organic human body. We have done that with thought. The relationship is with attention. The ultimate view is that we are pilots of our plane of existence, and what do we do? So once you give yourself freedom, you will also realize, think of it this way. Anytime fear happens, think of it this way. Uh, <laughs> anytime any sort of fear arises, instantly confront it in a silly way. Not in a silly way, but uh, like um, approach complexity simply and approach simplicity complexly and you'll be conscious of that dualistic realm I'm talking about so then your thoughts move on to a state where they begin to get speed in a previous talk where I was, spe I was speaking about the velocity of subjective vision it's like there is speed to it guys our minds are so fascinating they're like instruments that we still don't know how to play yet as a species I find the greater melodies arise from collective rhythm. That means the, all those birds flying in the air in that synchronized wave pattern, like, whoa, what is that? That's like all those beings are being one being. So inevitably, in the philosophical arguments of our future, as, a, as a, the future of civilization, we cannot avoid the possibility of the emergence of collective uh, a sort of common denominator to all various senses of personhood. Life is like this, guys. Think of this as if every person has the, as the, the divine eagle as a sort of spirit guide, you know. And when I say spirit guide, if you think spirit is in, inspiration, inspiration is attention, so, <laughs> so the idea is like a guide on its own. But it, well, whatever. What I'm saying is the ego is a fascinating creature. 
it can fly onto a branch and it can experience that branch of knowledge. It can live in that moment, be in that moment, observe the phenomena of that moment, do whatever the being wants in that moment. But the eagle then flies. A moment comes where it has dwelled on this branch for so long where its, it's, 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 it's claws are begging it to release. And so from the empires of uh, the branches of knowledge, we are in some sense lifting off into the skies of the unknown as a species and looking at the civilization from as if the eagle looking at the whole forest. Now that, that is a supremacy. That is an advancement of civilization that we become collectively self-aware. And for now, the best way we've managed to become collectively self-aware is by declaring certain universal human rights and by respecting these, understanding the importance that really the mind changes all the time. That means the, who you were 10 years ago, it's not the same person. You, don't, you literally don't have the same biological body. The cells of the body change every two weeks. This is why exercise is important. Pretty much it's the rhythm that keeps your body alive. Life is fascinating. It's um, honestly, it's literally like a car you're in, which you have to drive. Now you can choose not to drive it, or you can choose to drive it. The sages said you can either trust life, or you don't trust life. So you are. So the best thing to do is kind of like, all right, trust the moment of experience. Now, when you trust the moment of experience, this is the unique thing. This is why the inner voice has to be found before the truly the external world arises in meaning. The external world. So, so, so let me say it like this, that that strength that the writer needs to have to look at an empty page and trust that it's going to start something. Being able to start vision or application of vision. For me, it's like, let me tell you, um, I, was, I was like this as a kid. For example, like they showed me the Rubik's Cube and I would try to solve it. And, we, I would, and when I was really young, uh, there would be the, like uh, there was this cottage. We would go to our cottage. My family would go to this cottage outside of town, like two hour drive. And in the car, I would endlessly try to solve this cube. Eventually, I found a way to get two, two thirds of it easily done. So forever I can get two thirds of it easily done. Then the top layer was completely left to chance. So I was just trying like a slot machine, <laughs> trying to solve this Rubik's cube, you know? And it was something where later on I discovered an algorithm that I realized there is it becomes more complex that you do an incredible amount of moves just to change how one side is on, one, on, on the other. Like just to change one, one color of a cube, you know? The question taunted my existence to the point where I had to even push my fear aside and go see what this phenomenon was. So um, I'll leave you off with this, guys, that um, what I really mean by these conscious oscillations between worlds and selves is that 
as we go through life, life is not just a snapshot photo of you. You're not just a sentence of a meaning. You know, you're not just the thoughts you have in one moment. What it is, is like this momentum of conscious journeying with gaps of sleep time in between. Okay? So it's the kind of like reality is being this on and off switch of existence, no existence, existence, no existence. It's like with every blink, the visual system for a second sees the pitch black abyss and then returns, pitch black abyss return, pitch black. So what it is, is a kind of on and off switch. Even this, this it's strange, but the structure of the cosmos, like I'm speaking in, a, in a, through an astronomical context that it's like, look at it. It's like the planet is spinning around itself. The planet wants to get a full tan. Do you know? <laughs> and the sun is there to even brighten it. The fact that there is a sun, that's, it's like, you know, who knew? Who knew there was a giant, you know, ball of gas illuminating the whole cosmos, you know? <laughs> so, so, so anyways, what, um, what I'm saying is sometimes the attention in the moment, right now as I'm speaking, like as I move my hands, I, I, find, I, I find my attention to be a, a more like it's like 70% objective realm. Do you see? But when I'm super still and when I'm really trying to think at a, at, at a sort of higher speed, uh, not think at a higher speed, just a rhythm you find. The attention is dancing between an inner cause and an outer cause. An inner effect and an outer effect. The mind is finding itself when it closes its eyes to be the world. Uh, but when it opens its eyes, it's in a world through an objective mode, through a biological body. So what it is, is we have to become, we have to open a sort of... Uh, We have to, oh, we have, the only way we can preserve the true value of the creativity of the human mind is by somehow providing inner freedom. Uh, and what that means is genius will be shy until it's, it, it's, it's, it's certain, it's safe enough to perform. There's no story of, of, of a great humanity journeying into the, with space, through space and time. We're just, you know, busy people who gotta wake up and go to work, and what a what a what a what a dull life, you know. It's like we have to instantly merge the educational system, uh, with, with the thing. So what it is is all business organizations also become like schools, and all schools become like also business organizations. I've kind of predicted this as a sort of there's literally nowhere left. The educational system right now, the way, it, the direction it's heading, at least uh, as I see it in uh, Canada, where, um, which holds a high banner in the world. So I could tell you that uh, what's occurring is the captain of the ship of the educational system is literally like people don't care for knowledge they care for how much they are paid for their knowledge nowadays to care for knowledge means the attempt of mastery at least once in your lifetime at something Anyways, guys, if Zen Master Dogen was here, <laughs> he would say, before I end off the talk, that he would say, to follow Buddha's way, Buddha's path, you must study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to awaken to the nature of all things.
just like how that girl in the picture on the bridge realizes that the eyes of the planet is also wondering at the unknown that it's like imagine man suddenly shouted at, at God and it's like God why is the world like this why are you doing this and imagine God in that moment says I apologize I made a mistake and then what could man do do you see it's as if whatever interpretation whatever way we choose to personalize the unknown humanize the unknown it's like it's not man it's not man that's made in God's reflection it's God that's made in the attention of the moment every like where where every idea emerges You, it's kind of like this, just like how a person has to, you know, you got to take the furniture out of a room to create space if you want to bring new furniture. Sometimes the most creative visions have, have come to me at least when I've thrown away a sort of archetype and have dwelled as just observer in the moment until there has come another sort of uh, evocation in the moment. It's kind of like this, just like a camera can zoom in and out, we can zoom in on ideological phenomena to discover the void that is the mirror of the attention that's even existent through sight, uh, through space. So anyways, guys, it's like I wish, like, in, in, imagine, imagine this was like an assignment, a substitute teacher in a... Uh, like in middle school would give the kids, you know, study the self. <laughs> to study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to awaken to the nature of all beings. And eventually there was like the context explained that you are that awareness. Whatever you're seeking, you're already being. There's something there, guys. Be, be aware that you're right now being aware and there's there's an the unknown is is where really the uh, uh, without the unknown the explorer doesn't exist the greatest survival is to now that we are minds experience uh, the subjective realm but also to maintain and protect the objective realm from becoming devoured by a technological kind of evasion invasion because the thing is it's like I, t I can totally understand like the cyberspace culture kind of like um, when computers are being attempted to be connected to people's heads that's when there should be like a kind of warning sign there should be definitely like 10 years before that incident occurs there has to come some sort of uh, global kind of alarm or something so anyways, guys, thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Um, this talk has reached its destination. Some say true freedom is only true freedom if it was here all along. The skies are endless and so is man's mind.